Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have a Q&A session or a panel event organized within our anthropology theme. So um, we are so lucky that we have got actually two guests with us this evening. So we have an associate professor, Dr. Hannah Knox from University College London. And if you have read the information that's on our website, you will already know that Hannah's research is concerned with understanding processes of social and political transformation that is influenced by different technological materials. I hope that I got that right. <laughs> so recently, <laughs> she has been following the pursuit of carbon reduction strategies by um, a group or by a network of scientists and local authorities in Manchester. And our second guest is a lecturer from University of Manchester, Dr. Con um, Constance Smith. So Connie's uh, primary research focus is on the anthropology of architecture, uh, time, and I think urban change. And as part of her research interests, Connie has conducted extensive fieldwork abroad in Africa uh, in cities if, including uh, Nairobi and Kampala. So Connie and Hannah, firstly, thank you very much for sparing your time to be with us this evening. I look forward to learning more about your research through our discussion. But firstly, I would like to start uh, by asking you to introduce yourselves and your research areas in a bit more uh, detail first. So Hannah, would you like to go first? Yeah, yeah, sure. So thanks so much for inviting me. It's really nice to be able to be at, at this event today. So um, yeah, so I was having a think about how to talk about my research in terms of urban anthropology, which is the theme for the talk today. And I think for me, um, I mean, urban anthropology is really about the question of how we can study human culture as it relates to cities. Um, so how do people live in cities and how does that compare to uh, in, in cities uh, in different places in the world, um, questions about kind of what, what kinds of social relationships structure, how a city functions or what kind of social space is a city. So these are some of the kind of general questions that I think one might ask in, um, in urban anthropology. And I think in my own work, I've kind of engaged with cities in two main ways. So the first one has been um, asking questions about what, what, how cities think about themselves. So that sounds like a bit of a weird thing to say because obviously cities don't think, <laughs> but I've been really interested in how planners and engineers and policy makers talk about and think about the problem of what a city is and how it functions. And so in part, that's been a kind of trying to situate the way that people think about cities today in a bit of a kind of historical context. So I did my uh, doctoral research in Manchester actually, and I was looking this many years ago, but I was looking at um, the processes by which people were thinking about Manchester as a post-industrial city and how to kind of build its fortunes for the future, how to how to kind of understand what a post-industrial city could do to kind of regenerate itself, revamp itself. And that was particularly in relation to emerging digital technologies. So there was a lot of discussion at the time about how to make Manchester into a digital city, how to make it into a connect interconnected kind of modern city. So I was really interested in like, what does that tell us about the way we kind of think about what cities are and how they function? Um, and I started to kind of be really interested in things like some of the ways people would talk about the city as uh, as being in competition with other cities. So why is it that someone would think of a city as like a competitive entity, something that was like like a like a business or a corporation? And where did those ideas come from? And how are they represented in the ways that cities are branded and, and presented? So so one aspect of my work has really been about that. How do people who represent cities who who try to kind of engineer and manage cities think about what a city is and how's that changing and now we have lots of kind of high level discussions about smart cities and things like that so I'm kind of trying to kind of engage with those those kinds of ideas and really kind of get down to the everyday work that the people who are producing those ideas actually do and how and how does that how does how does those ideas of the, about the city emerge and then the second uh, kind of focus of my work, I think is more broad and I think it's probably more about 
the urban, so about the idea of what it means to be urban. And that might not actually really be to do with cities. So one of the things that I know some geographers have, have kind of argued is that, you know, everyone is urban nowadays. You don't have to live in a city to be urban. So it, in kind of historically, what would characterize cities as urban spaces would be the presence of particular kinds of infrastructure, roads and electricity networks and um sewer systems and IT systems um, and really those systems have kind of obviously kind of expanded and they're in all kinds of places but there's an interesting kind of question about how does being kind of connected to those infrastructures imply a certain kind of modern person a kind of urban person and so I did research um, after this work that I did in Manchester, I did some research in Peru, and there it was looking at roads, like road construction, we, and I did it with a colleague of mine who works at Manchester University, and we looked at the process by which the, the, the state in Peru was trying to kind of make rural spaces into, into kind of fully urban spaces, but was also trying to make rural people into kind of modern urban citizens and urban people. So that's the kind of second element of my work is really thinking, like really looking at like, how is the, what, what's the, how is the idea of the city? How does that translate into uh, the production of particular kinds of senses of a kind of moral virtue of particular kinds of people who are, who are urban people and what, and what does that look like uh, in, in, different, in different places around the world? I'll stop. That. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. And how about you, Connie? Would you like to tell us a bit more about yourself and your research? Sure. Um, so I think Hannah's given a really great introduction to uh, what is urban anthropology at the at the start of that. Um, so I suppose I should start by saying that I didn't start out as an urban anthropologist. So first of all, um, I studied history, uh, and then particularly African history. And then after that, I worked for quite a few years in, in museums uh, and I worked at the Museum for African Art. And while I was there, I got really interested in architecture and design. Um, and so from there, then I started, I, I did a PhD and then my PhD became about urban architecture and uh, city design. So I've kind of come through um, a sort of sideways track maybe into some of these questions. So because I was uh, started off as interested in, in architecture and, and building design, my interest in cities was a lot to do with how they changed over time and how the lifespans of people are, is very different to the architecture and the infrastructure that surrounds them. So, for example, in the UK, it's very common to live in a house that was built before you were born or even before your parents were, bo bo were born or your grandparents. And so we live constantly surrounded by um, a material world of, uh, of buildings and of roads and of um, a street design that was designed for a different time. And so my interest was really about, well, what influence does that material world have on how we live in cities now? And then how do people try to modify those spaces in different ways? So, of course, that happens uh, through uh, uh, government systems of changing road systems or building new estates or demolishing certain places. But it also happens in people's own DIY practices, mm. in how they start up community gardening projects, in how um, you know, people campaign for certain kinds of change within cities to improve their neighbourhoods um, or to, um, to shift uh, sort of very long-standing issues. Um, so my first project that I did was uh, in Nairobi, in Kenya, looking at um, a housing estate that was built in the 1940s as a kind of uh, model neighbourhood. So it was built by British colonial authorities in, in Kenya as um, a model neighbourhood for African families. So it was built with this very clear agenda to intervene in the day-to-day -day life, to change, to have a social impact. So to change how families live, to change how people's social lives operated, and ultimately to create what this colonial government saw as a kind of ideal colonial community. 
Um, so not one that was going to, um, uh, you know, rise up against a colonial authority. Then in practice, this neighborhood actually became a hotbed of nationalist politics. So I was really interested in you know, this estate that was designed to do something different seemed to generate a kind of very political sensibility and lots of the independence era activists and politicians lived in this neighborhood and the community hall that was set up to, you know, for very kind of um, uh, British or colonial ideas about what was a proper social life became this place for political meetings. And then now the estate still um, exists, but it's been pretty much abandoned by the government and residents now manage it for themselves. So it's very run down but they also have all kinds of interesting infrastructures in terms of how they sort out their water supply, the DIY extensions that people have built, and they've kind of really modified the streetscape in these very interesting ways. And so I started to think about how a city is this constant back and forth between the kind of social and political worlds that are going on, how those are influenced by particular architectures and urban planning, um, and how, as people gradually modify them, you get this kind of layering up of spaces. So even when things get demolished, there are always still traces that get left behind. And those kind of layered and accumulated um, aspects of uh, urban worlds are really influential in how we live our lives today. Um, yeah, shall I leave it there? No, no, uh, carry on. I can talk carry about on. my no, no, it's, it's very intriguing. So I would like to hear more, please carry on. I was just going to briefly mention what I've been doing uh, more recently, which is a project, uh, which is a more comparative project between London and Nairobi and Kenya. So this is taking on that theme about what happens when buildings fail or are demolished. Um, so this project is looking at the aftermath of housing disasters. So particularly the Grenfell Tower fire in London and a series of uh, tower block collapses that have happened in Nairobi. And so that's looking at how these kinds of very tragic events that are devastating in many ways have also prompted new kinds of uh, political activism and about what happens to those sites of failure, like what happens literally to the rubble, um, but also to the future of those places and how do they get rebuilt in ways that are maybe potentially quite transformative. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. It's it's all very interesting and, uh, you know, it's a lot of information to digest as well. So I'm sure we're going to come back to the points that you made, to the explanations that you've given later on as well. So one thing that I would like to ask to both of you is how well research done in developed countries do you think can be applied to um um, you know developing countries you know can you actually use different strategies or can you use the same strategy to make comparisons or to do your research in you know in a country as different as UK and in an African country for example do you want to answer that Connie because it's directly <laughs> related to sure. the recent project um, so I think comparison in anthropology generally is a really interesting question because um, it is very comparative in the sense that um, when we do research, um, we don't usually distinguish between developing and developed countries. So there's a, a sense in which uh, we don't kind of start with a hypothesis that then we go and test that anthropology uses a method called ethnographic research, which is based on uh, participant observation with the uh, it's what we call inductive research so it starts from the ground and builds up so you gradually layer up your knowledge and then that is kind of how you start to arrive at some of your findings so that lends itself quite well to doing work all over the world because the idea is that the field work is driven by the place and the people that you're working with um so in that sense, it's comparative when you may be writing up or writing articles or writing books in that you draw on examples from all over the world. But I suppose it's a bit more unusual for it to be comparative in that you deliberately set out to look at similar issues in two very different cities. So this is a question I get a lot because people say, how can you do anthropology that is comparative? It doesn't really seem like a very obvious link. So 
one answer to that is that my work is actually very interdisciplinary and so I draw on lots of different methods from various subjects. But also for, for me in this case, um, I was really struck by, um, so this project was really kind of triggered by one day, one particular day in June 2017, which was the day of the Grenfell Tower fire. And on the same day, um, a tower block collapsed in Nairobi in the neighborhood where I'd been working previously. And I was following both of these events as they unfolded. And I was really struck by the similarity of conversations that were happening in both cities, even though they're so different. So uh, conversations around things like uh, urban inequality, a housing crisis, what is the right way to live in a city? You know, do tower blocks make good places to live? Um, how should we think about what the city should be in the future? These kinds of questions were coming up in, on, on Twitter, social media, in the press. And so for me, I wasn't so much taking, thinking about taking research from London to see what happened in Nairobi, but more to see how is it that two such different places could be having quite similar conversations. So could you tell us how is it possible then? You know, it's just, you know, obviously probably same mistakes has been um, sort of happened in two different places. But do you think that's coincidence or do you think that's something that you would also look into in terms of human behavior that led to those problems? Yes, yeah, so there is... Um... Uh, so different, there's kind of various different intersecting things. So I think as Hannah was saying, um, you know, in this kind of era of how cities position themselves globally, there is an amazing interconnection of cities that maybe is not, um, not obvious from when you see cities on the surface. But so for example, we look at things to do with um, property investments, so sort of flows of transnational capital, ideas about how you pitch your city to particular uh, sources of finance, like maybe that's the EU or the World Bank or those kinds of instruments can really become ways of, that have quite hard to see on the surface, but really big implications for how cities go about building different spaces or um, the kinds of ways of whether they think that social justice is an important issue, whether you think the city should be for the people who already live there, or if you're trying to attract a different kind of person into the city. Um, so those kinds of questions, I think, you know, those are definitely questions that are a big deal in London, which is a place of huge financialization and big property markets and things like that. But there are actually also really big questions in Nairobi too. And they're not directly, you know, it's not following the money from London to Nairobi or vice versa, it's not that direct, but lots of those instruments also have effects in, um, in African cities as well. Okay, great, thank you. So Hannah, so um, coming to you then, are there, do you think that there are any world events uh, from recent times that have uh, driven the strongest or the fastest ethnographic change in the UK from your perspective? So, well, I, yeah, I, I prob probably wouldn't put it in quite those terms, but I think that one of the things that I've really been in, interested in in recent years is looking at the implications of climate change for mm -hmm. cities. And actually it comes back a little bit to what Connie was just saying about trying to think about what are the similarities between the way that uh, a kind of issue that gets talked about maybe using the same language in different places is actually kind of unfolded and manifested in different ways in different parts of the world. So I've been really interested in the, it, in relation to those two kind of areas of research that I talked about, the way the city is imagined and then the sense of like what a good urban citizen or kind of urban person is, to think what like what are the what what have been the implications in recent years of um, impetus for cities to take into account climate change. And, and it's quite an interesting um, quest question, I think, because actually 
cities are one of the sites where a lot of things have happened about climate change. There's a lot of struggle at national level for um, uh, that gets a lot of press. Obviously, we've got like the COP26 coming up. There's kind of a lot of focus on the negotiations between national governments and arguments about the responsibility of different places to respond to climate change or even like questions about like the truth of climate change and is it really happening or is it not happening but meanwhile cities in in all kinds of different ways around the world have been on the ground kind of confronting both the question of how climate change is going to affect those places so whether there's going to be flooding whether there needs to be kind of strategies for making sure that the citizens of particularly cities are protected from climate change and there's also been discussions about cities as spaces where people can like tackle carbon emissions but of course even though that's shared and there's international networks like the C40 cities network where people are literally kind of meeting and policymakers are meeting and having conversations about what they're doing. They're sharing knowledge and building standards and creating these kind of global structures. The way that then that unfolds in particular places is, is, um, is often quite different. So in my research, I didn't do a comparative. I haven't done a comparative study, if you like, of Manchester, where I did some research on climate change and how it's affecting the city and another city but I've read a, I've read a lot about from from other anthropologists and other people in urban studies who've looked at things like the emergence of eco cities in in the context of China for example or um the development of um, ideas about kind of federal responses to climate change in other European countries and actually what that what that shows and what I think the research that I've been trying to do shows is that there's constantly a process by which people are trying to take those big global issues and make them relevant to the to the specific kind of contexts in which they're working. So in Manchester, there were some really interesting um, ways in which climate change started to be linked. Well, first of all, it was linked to the narrative about Manchester being the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. So here we are in the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, which for most of Manchester's history has been celebrated as something that like characterizes the city as a really fantastic, vibrant, kind of energetic place where people kind of work hard and produce things that are innovative. And now this city is like, at the forefront, you know, sort of got this kind of legacy, this history that has led to this global crisis. So, you know, how is a city like Manchester going to take on board that question of the responsibility that it might have um, to repair its kind of past and the and the, the the impacts that it had before? And um, and so certain things kind of appeared in the research that I didn't expect at all. So I I I wrote about things like the the way that um, um, bees started to appear as a kind of uh, symbol of, of um, environmental change. So in Manchester, the bee is quite interesting because it was it, the bee is like the symbol of Manchester. If you walk around the city, it's like on the bins and it's on the bollards. And the reason, and it does a mosaic in the city hall, um, in the town hall and the reason why the bee was the book was the symbol of manchester was because it was the worker it's like the worker bee and the hive was seen as like the kind of analogy of the industrial factory system and yet in a lot of these kind of climate reports bees were also then being kind of repurposed as as kind of sentinels of climate change so like beehives were being put on top of the the of public uh, institutions like the art gallery pictures of beekeepers would be on the front of policy documents to do with climate change so i became really interested in the way that these very general kind of problems like climate change become localized and i think then the way they become localized can tell us a lot about um about the struggles that people face in actually doing something about a really complex and difficult problem like climate change. So, um, so I think it goes back a bit to what Connie was saying that as anthropologists, we're always trying to kind of look at what's specific about a particular place, but then from what from understanding what's specific, we can then kind of put ourselves into conversation with the way that things which are kind of given the same terminology 
unfold in different places and we can start to kind of build up uh, a conversation where we can where we can look at the 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 kind of actually the dynamics that sometimes get hidden by very generalizing language about sort of urban development and climate change or something like that that might not attend to those specific relationships okay very interesting thank you and you know the, the link that you made between to be and it may be the um you know that might you said it that might represent the struggles that the um sort of the local area is going through so can you actually tell us about you know which struggles you're referring to you know what is that link and how do you know that you know or how do you drive that conclusion that that might be a representation of the struggles it's very interesting and would like to know a bit more if that's okay yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, so what I did in this um, this kind of re relatively recent research that I just finished, you know, I finished and written up as a book that came out last year, is I really kind of went into like spending a lot of time with those people who had taken it upon themselves to try to get the city of Manchester to take take responsibility for its carbon emissions and to reduce those carbon emissions and to make it part of the kind of project of tackling climate change. And I went into that project with a set of questions about, I suppose, like what would, you know, what would be, what were going to be the unforeseen consequences of the kind of interventions that were being made? So what would be the social consequences of things like, um, you know, sort of cycle schemes or, or or housing insulation or whatever it was that was going to appear. But actually what I ended up really looking at a lot in the project, because this is what everyone was kind of struggling with, was the real problem of how to make climate change matter within, you know, literally within council meetings or within um, uh, discussions between um, councillors, uh, officers and the, and the general public. And that was a real that was a real struggle like it there was um and i think it continues to be a struggle i think it has kind of relevance for uh for kind of ongoing um difficulties around actually whether you know anyone is really going to be able to make the changes that are necessary to uh tackle this massive kind of challenge that is climate change and the struggle for me, it was, as, as I observed it and from this particular vantage point of working with local authorities and working with activists and people who were really trying to do, do something about climate change, was that it fundamentally that, that, they, that the, they were trying to work with scientific data and models um, about climate change. But these really jarred with uh, the way that um, interventions in the city had been justified in the past. So. Um, rather than rather than kind of identifying a problem within a particular community or a neighborhood that's identified either by people kind of making a lot of noise saying we've got this problem in our neighborhood and we want someone to do something about it or by kind of um, gathering information and doing research in the city on kind of things like health outcomes or poverty or epidemiology here with climate change you have a problem which rather than coming from the bottom up was kind of being imposed from the top down here's this global problem and this city's going to have to like deal with a, like a chunk of that problem and that was really hard to square with what people were trying to actually do on a day-to-day -day level which was to respond to kind of health issues and uh, or questions of um working out the relationship between whether a local authority should be providing services or whether that should be outsourced to the private sector for example um and so what what i found was that the the, the only times really when anything could happen was when it when it kind of dovetailed with already existing activities. So um, one of the areas that there was a lot of work on was around fuel poverty, because that had already been identified sort of from the bottom up as a, as, a, as a kind of problem for the city. It had implications for public health, it had um, implications for the economy, for um, people's capacity to kind of participate in the city. And so a lot of the discussions about climate change and insulating houses became kind of kind of like almost like smuggled in <laughs> into discussions about about fuel poverty so there were these like challenges that were that that were really fundamental 
and I think to yeah to go back I think your question was <laughs> go back to the bees and why they were part of that um struggle and I think that one of the, one of the things then that people talked to me a lot about was that you had these kind of departments which had responsibility for these very kind of discrete things that already had uh kind of ways of responding to them like the kind of things I've just been talking about but actually climate change was a kind of massively interconnected problem and there were and they and I think that the the bees as I said I think that they were like a kind of almost like a almost like a kind of symbol of the complexity of climate change that if you you know it was a sort of almost like a displacement from the the challenge of sort of every day trying to map everything out and put it into categories and boxes and feeling really like it was really difficult to do that and there was there was almost like a sense that if the if you could have you know the bees were almost like a sign that everything was okay mm-hmm. <laughs> and as long as they were okay then in a sense that was a signal that people were doing enough and doing the right thing but um so that maybe it was a kind of replacement for the impossibility of knowing even whether you were doing enough or whether you were doing the right thing uh, in the face of all these challenges, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for this detailed explanation. It's very interesting to hear about these things. So this then is making me to think about the change that um, Kenya has gone through in recent years, Connie. So um, obviously, Kenya has been um, attracting a lot of attention in recent years because of uh, the um, way that they developed as one of the strongest economies in Africa. So what kind of events or challenges or struggles do you think has pushed them to go this way? Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure, yeah. So, um so one of the really interesting things about working in Kenya is that it has incredibly, as a country, has incredibly high uh, take up of uh, mobile technologies and digital technologies. Um, so some things that we've only recently adopted, things like uh, mobile banking, for example, have been working in Kenya for about 15 or 20 years now. So, and we're actually pioneered there, particularly mobile banking really comes out of a, of, of a Kenyan um, kind of digital startup uh, move. So, and that kind of digital scene in, in Kenya, you know, of course there are, there are startups, there are incubators, there's kind of a whole uh, sector of that, but there's a really interest, what's really interesting also is how that spills over into the rest of life for, for everyone else in the city and in the country. And I think this is really part of how Kenya has been trying to position itself um, as a, uh, you know, not as a kind of developing African country that it's, you know, it wants to kind of leave that stereotype behind, but and see itself as part of this um, kind of global network of cities, perhaps more in the vein of somewhere like Dubai or Singapore or these kinds of relatively new kind of players in an urban world. So um, incomes in Kenya are um, much higher than they used to be, and there is a a growing middle class. But in many ways, as probably is the case with most cities around the world, a lot of this happens at um, a kind of uh, imaginary scale in terms of how the city tries to brand itself or think about how it's positioned in the world. And in, in Kenya, this takes the form of a debate around um, what they see as the world-class city. So there's a something called um, Vision 2030, which is the government's uh, development strategy uh, for the future, which says some, it's something like turning Nairobi into a world-class city. Um, and so that's very much part of this, this agenda. One of the really interesting things about Vision 2030 is that it was uh, developed together with McKinsey, which is a big um, strategy and consultancy firm that works all over the world. And McKinsey also worked on uh, Mumbai 2030, uh, Hyderabad 2030. So, and you actually often see a lot of the same terms and the same language appearing and in these um, city strategies 
uh, all over the world. So that's a kind of interesting example, maybe of also what Hannah was talking about in terms of this positioning. Um, so I think I'm, I'm interested in these kinds of policies and imaginary worlds, not really in terms of what they mean for, for government or for kind of elite uh, practice, but how they have knock-on effects for other people in the city in quite unpredictable ways. So um, in terms of my work around um, housing and these building collapses that I was mentioning, uh, there's a really interesting debate that has come up about um, what in, in Nairobi is called fake buildings. Mm. So the buildings that collapse are sometimes described as fake. Um, and this has a kind of whole set of uh, things that go along with it, but it's basically a way of criticizing uh, a system of, of running a city that is all about surface and that there's no depth, so there's no content. So on the surface, it looks like one thing, but when you get into it, you realize that this is just as badly made or corrupt or inefficient as the system that you had before or the building that you had before. So uh, I think this is one thing that um, really struck me uh, when I was visiting various neighborhoods that had been through this, this kind of really devastating experience of having a building collapse. And one woman explained, who lived um, next door to a building that collapsed, she described it in this really brilliant way, which she said, you know, this building looked like Dubai, but when it collapsed, we realized that Dubai was only on the outside. And so you get this interesting thing about, okay, so Ken is positioning itself one way, but actually what is it doing for kind of ordinary citizens, ordinary residents in the city who, you know, don't have the capacity to tap into those kinds of digital economies, but they're still dealing with the repercussions or the unintended effects. So that's kind of one of the themes that I've been looking at. Okay, very interesting. So you mentioned uh, something at the start. You said that, you know, the uptake of, for example, mobile banking was 15 years before what, you know, what we have started to do in the UK. What do you think are the factors that's influencing that? that? That is very surprising and interesting. You know, I would like to know more about that, if that's OK. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not I'm not an expert in mobile banking, so I'm not sure I'm going to I can't really give you lots of facts and stats. But um, one of the interesting aspects about this kind of um, digital development and mobile technology development is because um, so there was a situation in, in not only in Kenya, but in lots of parts of the world where people are people don't have um, mainstream bank accounts or they don't have access to savings or credit that um, comes through kind of what in the UK we would look at as the banking sector. So they don't have access to loans um, or those kinds. And they're often also working with very, very small amounts of money. So you imagine sort of someone, you know, selling vegetables at the market, they're really dealing with, the, they're, they're buying these fruits and vegetables from a wholesaler and then they're selling them. But the kind of numbers that you're talking about is very small. And so it's um, it's a business, but it's also, you know, doesn't have the capacity for kind of large savings and people are generally spending what they take in. So there's a kind of move um, in the early 2000s, which is sometimes called banking the unbanked, which is about how you open up um, forms of um, microfinance, it's usually called. So forms of banking for people who don't have access to what we might call mainstream services. Um, and this has happened in lots of different ways. So I know in India, for example, there's... Um, uh, microfinance initiatives which are often saving schemes that enable people to put money aside in very very tiny amounts and so they operate in a slightly different way. Um, I'm not it's hard to say why Kenya became this kind of digital place. Um, I think it's like one of those things where you know one thing starts and then it kind of snowballs then people get interested and then other bigger companies start investing or offering grants and things like that and it's kind of spiraled. Um, but it, it's a really interesting aspect to, to not just to Nairobi, actually, but to the country generally, which has the So there's now, I mean, it also has a dark side as well, it should be said. So there's also lots of ways in which all kinds of um, 
not just positive things like mobile banking might get trialed, but also all kinds of, of scams get trialed in Kenya, um, all kinds of, um, you know, the darker side of having this incredibly connected um, usage of technology and also very high social media take up. So there's a kind of, um, yeah, it's not always a positive story, but it is a kind of interesting aspect. Lovely. Thank you very much. So it has been 40 minutes since we started uh, talking and I'm sure you're tired. So let's give a little break or maybe of maybe five minutes. So this is an opportunity for our audience to submit their questions through our YouTube channel. So you can see, use the chat function on the right hand side. If you're watching us through our social media accounts, you can also leave your questions there and I will be collating all those and we'll be asking those questions on your behalf to our guests. So thank you very much. And let's take a break and fill up our coffee cups. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for staying with us through our short break uh, to give a little rest, breathing space to our guests. So thank you very much again for the interesting insights that you have provided about social anthropology. I myself have learned quite a lot. So I would like to start with a question from our audience. So they're asking, so GDP is one of those um, measures of how well a country is doing. As it says, uh, nothing about inequality. What is your point of view uh, in terms of um, what would be an ideal measure of how well a country is doing? Shall I have a go? <laughs> yeah, why don't you start, Hannah? Okay. Yeah, I think I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I think the the you know it's some the the kind of issue of where these indicators come from and who they're useful for and what they imply is something I've actually thought about a lot, particularly in relation to my work on climate change. Because one of the big arguments is that, as well as not a kind of revealing um, inequality, it also doesn't reveal the costs of um, the environmental costs of, of the economy. And one like there's some really interesting work I'd be quite influenced by, by that actually tracks the history of the emergence of GDP as a measure and the appearance of the very kind of idea of the economy as something that you can that you can kind of um, describe and measure and kind of conceive of something that you can kind of manipulate through economic levers. Um, and, and one scholar called Timothy Mitchell makes an argument that actually before really, really the economy was an invention of the 20th century. So before the kind of early to mid 20th century, people talked about economy, but they didn't talk about the economy as a thing. So one of the things is that I think it's really like, I think as anthropologists, one of the things we're kind of quite interested in is how those, those indicators and those measures come about. I think it's harder to answer the question, like what would be an ideal indicator to replace GDP? And I think the reason that that's a hard question to answer uh, from the perspective of anthropology is I think we would always ask the question, um, ideal for who? So GDP might be super ideal if what you're trying to do is make an international economic argument, a performative argument about how good your country is in comparison with other countries around the world. When you're looking for, for um, trying to kind of um, get loans or get credit as a low rate of interest. But of course, it's kind of completely a dead loss if you're trying to describe as I say, um, the environmental impact of the things that a country does or questions of social inequality. So I, my sense is there isn't really one good measure, but there's definitely a lot of possibility and opportunity to really critically think about what are the effects of the indicators and the measures that we use and what could be some alternative measures. Um, and there's a, at UCL where I work, there's an organization called the Global Prosperity Institute. And one of the things that they've been doing over the past few years is really trying to think about what would be some alternative indicators. I'm, a, I'm not involved in that work, so I'm afraid I can't like report back on, on exactly what they've come up with, but that's definitely a really good place to go to see. And that, that institute is headed up by 
by an anthropologist actually interestingly so it's an interesting place to go to see what kinds of alternatives uh are com- people are coming up with and I certainly know about some like the there's been kind of proposals for a happiness index or indeed indexes of um, inequality and there are kind of um sustainable development goals which work on indexes that are kind of broader than gdp but ultimately i think it's that question that who is it a good indicator for who like what who who is it helping that i would think is a kind of anthropological answer to that question okay. well thank you so connie what do you think yes yeah, so um so you had us taken the words out of my mouth, really. So before I uh, joined the University of Manchester, I worked for the Institute of Global Prosperity. <laughs> so um, this is, yeah, as Hannah said, one of the key questions of the Institute is thinking about, uh, I suppose we might call it applied anthropolo- anthropology, in that how can we take the methods that anthropology uses, so this very grassroots way of understanding people's own perspectives on their day-to-day lives, about what makes a good neighbourhood, what what would constitute a good life for them, ideas that... Um, Uh, everyone has about um, their ambitions, their goals, about flourishing, about the challenges that they face and what is hindering them from from achieving a a good life. How would you take those kinds of grassroots questions and put them into something that could be used uh, in different places around the world or in different parts of a city also? So I think it's a really, really interesting question. So lots of it, um, the way it's still in development, but I think I've wrap my brains now for how, how it was a few years ago I was working on it but so it's split into different sections so there's sections around um, quality neighborhoods and housing so that might encompass things to do with the environment uh, air quality um, access to housing which includes um, also uh, you know forms of tenure and costs of housing then there are things to do with um, health and quality of life and then aspects to do with aspirations, uh, education, futures, and how the processes by which you can achieve them. Um, So yes, as Hannah said, it's far from the only place that is doing this. So there's also the Legatum Prosperity Index, which also looks at quite similar uh, set of uh, indicators, but measures them slightly differently and uses different methods. Um, But I think this is really part of a much more kind of diverse movement, which I think is really, really interesting and which um, anthropology in various ways has contributed to, which is about thinking about uh, prosperity without growth. So what would prosperity look like in a a world that wasn't premised on an obsession with with economic growth? And I think uh, one of the major uh, players in this is... um, someone called Tim Jackson, who runs the sustainable, I think it's, is it called the Sustainable Development Institute, I think. Um, And his work along with others now a kind of growing field of um, economics, um, which, you know, started off as quite fringe or radical economics and is increasingly now coming into more mainstream uh, teaching and and research. And I think it's a really interesting um, avenue But as Hannah said, yeah, the question that anthropology would always come back to is, well, who is designing these mechanisms? What do they think they're going to be used for? You know, it has to be part of um, a kind of more critical perspective as well. Okay, thank you. It's very um, interesting to hear about your opinions on this and the research that's ongoing. So um, the second question is, how comparable are the social changes that different communities or areas undergo as they become digitalized. Any takers? Do you want to <laughs> talk about? Well, I was thinking in relation to your uh, work, on what you were talking about around banking. Whether you wanted to pick that up, honey? Sure, I can come in with that. I mean, I'm sure you have lots to say about digital anthropology too. Um, so. There are lots of social changes that come about through digital technologies, but I think also another thing that anthropologists always like to do is to turn the question around. And so we would also say that digital worlds have also been transformed by social changes. So, and I think that interplay is what makes um, a kind of anthropological question or area of research 
So, um, I mean, Hannah will talk about this more probably, but UCL is quite uh, pioneering in this regard. So looking, for example, at things like Facebook and how Facebook, um, you know, is this kind of global superpower on the one hand, but actually how the way that it gets used and the way that it's incorporated in people's lives has very big differences all over the world and that that has a feedback effect on social media itself. Um, but I think there's also some, in terms of what I was talking about previously, there's some really interesting aspects in terms of um, forms of community and connection that can develop that are not based on place. So, you know, basic idea that if you have a mobile phone that you can speak to someone who lives in a completely different place. And so in, um, very rural areas of Kenya, for example, uh, your mobile phones were being became much more accessible often before people had a decent road network or they certainly weren't um, kind of centralized infrastructures like phone systems and um, uh, internet connections. Wow. And houses. So in that sense, um, I think one of the interesting things about how you see mobile and digital technology in African context is that um, they've gone immediately from nothing to a kind of mobile. So there was no like interim stage of a fixed infrastructure, like a landline or a fax machine or a modem or these kinds of things have gone straight into, um, uh, you know, kind of 3G and then 4G technology in terms of smartphone usage. So that does, present a whole different set of dynamics than maybe we see in, in Europe or North America with a kind of more incremental shift in technology take up. Um, and I think that perhaps is also why Kenya has been so good at innovating with these technologies because you know they have been early adopters. So 5G, for example, has been in Nairobi for years, and we're only just getting it now in the UK. So those kinds of issues, you know, they're early adopters. So they're also messing around with things, hacking, developing new kinds of techniques. And yeah, there's certainly knock on uh, social changes then in terms of um, entrepreneurial activities, business activities, but also social family connections that are start to look different in different ways. Lovely. Yeah, I mean, I I think I would just like kind of like compliment or add to to what Connie had said based on uh, uh based on my work at UCL. So at UCL, I'm part of a group of of kind of scholars who work in a field that's broadly called digital anthropology, um, and that really one of the big kind of conversations we have in that in that field is about to what extent can we make claims that particular kinds of digital technologies have particular kinds of social effects um, at, at the are kind of similar in in different parts of the world, and certainly there are there is evidence that kind of the uh, the emergence of kind of new um, digital Digital platforms like uh, you know, like Facebook, but like TikTok, or you know, many of these platforms do have kind of similar issues, similar kinds of effects amongst different kinds of communities. But that's always in tension with an observation that I think is really important that Connie mentioned as well, which is that people always make um, something different of the media that they're using. So that it will always be appropriated and played with and creatively transformed to be part of the kinds of social lives that people have. And so one of my colleagues, uh, Danny Miller, he's really kind of advocated for this understanding of technology, not as something that determines how people are in their like relationships with one another, but something that's really shaped by the particular context in which these technologies are used. So he did this um, comparative study of social media that looked at nine different countries around the world. He had researchers in each of these different countries and he's also done a subsequent project, again, kind of replicating this, looking at smartphones. And really just the book that came out of the social media project was called How the World Changed Social Media. So rather than the normal kind of how social media changed the world, how, how actually the world changed social media. And you just see this huge variety in the way that people are using social media in their lives. So um, and also a kind of surprise as well. So I think a lot of the researchers who worked on that project went into their field sites with an expectation about how social media was going to be used. There was one 
person, for example, who was working with migrants who were working in a factory in, in China. And she went in with the expectation that the main way that people would be using social media would be to keep in contact with their family who they'd left and to keep a kind of connection with the rural areas in which they worked. But actually, she found that's actually not what people were doing. They were really using social media to be kind of um, demonstrating or performing the kinds of consumption that they were engaged in now that they were living in a city, now that they were, had money or they were working in these in these kinds of high tech factories. And that actually it was much more about the kind of performance of themselves as as kind of modern urban Chinese citizens rather than about a connection to the countryside or another person who um, went to. Um, Turkey, and she was really interested in how social media was used in a in a kind of highly politicized context. And she thought her project was going to be all about politics, but actually, she found no one did any politics in social media because it was a very difficult place to to use that kind of public forum to have political discussions because it was very surveyed, it's very kind of monitored, and so social media became this kind of other space where you didn't do politics. So there were lots of kind of findings that came out of these um, projects that kind of really disrupt the sense that we could know and that, that it made sense to ask the same questions in different places about how technologies uh, were being used. But it also showed, like, in a way, it was kind of quite, quite hopeful in a way, because it showed the really creative ways in which people are and do use these, uh, these platforms and these technologies in all kinds of, like, in a huge variety of ways that are often glossed over by the sort of media representation of, of the impacts of something like social media on social life. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you both. It was really lovely to have you both. I learned a lot about social anthropology myself this evening, and I'm sure our audience has appreciated it as well. So we had you with us for an hour. I think it's time to let you go about your the rest of your evening. So uh, thanks a lot for your time and look forward to having you again as a guest and getting updates about your research. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thanks very much. It was thanks. great.